using the ground station effectively to be able to you know get your uh, signals in etc and what all you can do with that that actually is very exciting for me um, so <clears throat> that's what i would like to do um, and uh, anuj how much time do i have uh, if you could give me an indication then you know i'll i'll yes, pace sir. myself accordingly uh, you can uh, have it for 35 to 40 minutes till 11. all right fine yeah. thank you very much thank you very much so uh, let me actually begin uh, with my uh, own story of uh, how I started working satellites, which ultimately led many, many years later, decades, about probably half a century later, to uh, establishing Satellites, the company that I work for now. Oh, you can see this here. So uh, what happened was that uh, there, was, there were three radio hams actually in India who were working on satellites. Uh, one was VU2 UV, Subi. He's still alive, uh, you know, very old, but he's there in Bangalore. He was, you know, India's first radio ham to start using uh, satellites. They, these satellites were called the Oscar satellites, and, uh, you know, they had VHF up and HF down. That was a key thing. Uh, then the second uh, radio ham to start doing this was VU2 RM. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Rao, Ram Mohan Rao. He was an excellent home brewer as well, which is he made all his equipment by himself. And he was, you know, up in uh, Kakinada uh, without any contact to with any other fellow person. You know, there's no internet. There are very few actually even magazines coming in from outside, leave alone textbooks. So I just want you to uh, appreciate that in the 70s and even in the 80s, we had very, very little information to go on with. Uh, even TLEs, uh, which predict TLEs are these numbers that you put into a software and it will tell you where the satellite is at any particular point in time. Uh, the two line elements, even they were impossible to get. So, <clears throat> uh, but you know, hearing that Arun, uh, Rao, and uh, Subi were doing this stuff. We as kids were extremely excited and we thought that there has to be some way that we can also get onto the satellites. And the first thing that you do is, of course, try to listen to these satellites, right? So uh, I had built an HF radio of my own, uh, which is not a very difficult thing to do. And just put up a wire antenna. And now you have to wait for the satellite to show up uh, there is no way of knowing when it will come, which side it will come from, etc. But what we knew is that it was launched in the late morning about this time, 10 o'clock window. So about 10 o'clock, around 10 o'clock sometime, you know, the satellite may turn up is all we knew. Uh, so <clears throat> I was actually working with my friend Amar and Amar was in Guntur, uh, off Guntur actually. Uh, so first to get through to him itself was difficult because he didn't have a telephone line there in his village. So on, on radio, you had to contact him. And once you establish contact, then you say, did you hear something? Did I hear something, etc." that sort of a thing. And after about a week, we, uh, Amar managed to hear a very weak, faint, but you know, definite beacon coming from the Oscar 7 uh, on 27, uh, 29 megahertz. And we knew that, you know, at that time that at least our radio works, however bad our antenna is. And then we you know, tweak the antenna, et cetera, et cetera. And then we started listening around the same time. <clears throat> and what we realized was that every day, the beacon would come half an hour late, okay? So essentially what was happening was this, that uh, if this was the satellite pass, you know, one day the next satellite pass would probably be you know shifted out a little bit because earth has moved not integral number of times but you know with slight amount of uh, you know offset so what we realized is that these orbits which are going north to south approximately uh, were going you know shifting out by half an hour so if it came at 10 o'clock today it was 10 30 tomorrow then 11 o'clock then 11 30 etc and by the time it came to 11 o'clock uh, 11 a.m pass there was a second pass appearing at 10 at 9:30 which would again you know start jumping by half an hour on a daily basis 
So next day the 9:30 pass would come at 10. The 10, you know, then 10:30. By the time this comes to 10:30, then there's a new pass coming at nine o'clock. So uh, that way we figured that the orbit is about one and a half hours or about 90 minutes long. That is one orbit and the second orbit, and you can get about two orbits. At times, we could even get three orbits uh, uh, simultaneously because one would be complete overhead and two would be completely on the sides, you know, I mean, on the horizon as we saw it. And we estimated that um, it's an overhead pass because the signal would be significantly uh, more powerful uh, as opposed to what we would call as a glancing pass. So when it passes, you know, very far away, it's, it just sort of appears on the horizon and, you know, it just goes away or, you know, it appears on this horizon and goes away. So uh, to get hold of those signals uh, of glancing passes required us to build a directional antenna and uh, at 29 megahertz, the wavelength is about 10 meters long, right? So half a wavelength, which is what you need for a dipole would be about five meters. And a Yagi antenna accordingly would have at least three elements of five meters each. And it would be a fairly elaborate thing. So we decided to just give up on that and we didn't do much there. But what we did realize a couple of things and some questions were also asked was that Although we had no idea of where the satellite was appearing from, uh, with experience, we could make out whether the satellite was coming towards us or going away from us. Because as it started to come towards us, the frequency of, because of Doppler would be higher, right? So, uh, and it would, if it was exactly on the predicted frequency, that is, uh, you know, the published frequency of the beacon. We knew that it was somewhere right overhead, right? So it was just passing overhead. As a result, uh, the surface velocity would be, you know, lesser. And as it started receding away from us, we would know that the satellite is now moving away from us. So uh, that was an approximation. But I think now with uh, computers available, etc., you can approximate. Uh, you don't have to approximate. You can actually do these things far in a far more, uh, you know, elaborate manner. So um, uh, that was actually our first contact with uh, satellites. And uh, the, the amazing thing was that we were using almost all equipment built out of walls and analog uh, electronics entirely, of course, uh, with no computational facility. Yeah, even if we had it, you know, we didn't even know how to program uh, computers at that point. But nevertheless, um, there is an intuition, there is a experience, which will also help you with satellites. And that was my big point that, you know, it is important for you to develop an intuition into this, because as radio hams, we do things experimentally and through experiments, which is experience, we sort of, you know, find out and get a hang of these things, right? So for example, let's say cricket, uh, you're running to catch a ball. Um, now you can put a lot of maths into it. You can say that the ball's trajectory is uh, determined by uh, Newton's laws of gravity and uh, motion. And you can put that into some sort of a three dimensional, you know, differential equation and say, okay, you know, now the ball is coming here and I need to, uh, you know, run at this speed and slow down so that you know the trajectory of the ball and uh, you, yourself will you know coincide etc but that's too much right you do all that mentally uh, because you have an you have an intuitive way of doing it i mean you know th there is some analog computing which happens in your own brain so that's the key thing that you need to know so <clears throat> i want to stress uh, as much on hands on operating the uh, satellite station that you build. That actually is the most important thing for you to do. Uh, more, you know, so start small. Uh, you don't have to have a very elaborate thing. In fact, I would uh, dissuade you from first putting up a directional antenna. Okay, just put up an omnidirectional antenna. Uh, in fact, actually you need two omnidirectional antennas, okay? So what happens is uh, if you have a vertical antenna, you know, a stick like that, uh, it basically is able to take uh, signals from sides, you know, from the horizon very well. 
but it has a cone of silence when it comes to top because you know it's just a point here so uh, signals coming like this will just fall through the antenna into the ground so uh, one antenna which is vertical and another antenna which is a cross dipole like that right so which can actually look up so you can switch between these two with a simple switch on vhf or uhf and use these to start monitoring the satellites uh, once you know uh, how to track them etc cetera, etc cetera, then you can you know do a better job and maintain a log whoever is operating the satellite you know the sign in saying that okay i've come in at this point in time it has to be a physical log book say that you know i heard so and so satellite etc cetera, etc cetera. and if you've recorded the satellite it's it's a good thing to record it because recording is pretty cheap now on your computer or on your phone or whatever uh, put the wave files name number etc with that as well <clears throat> so the 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 really interesting thing here is more than the beacon the telemetry and almost all low earth orbit satellites give fairly detailed telemetry and that telemetry is actually very important because somebody was for example asking us <clears throat> uh, how do you get to the attitude of a satellite so actually through the telemetry you can determine that the way you do it is like this um what happens is that a satellite is a cube of sorts right let me pull out a cube for you guys so that you can... this is not a satellite but <clears throat> so it's like a cube right most of the cube sats are like cubes and it's sort of tumbling all the way through uh, however slowly so as it tumbles and suppose you are the sun uh, this side gets exposed but as it is actually rotating away uh the solar voltage on the solar panel will now dip and it will become zero and then it will again come up <clears throat> right so as the tumble happens uh, the telemetry actually reports the reports the uh, the voltages on each of the solar cells at least all the mature radio satellites do that right so if you capture them over uh, over the entire pass okay and plot it then you can know for example the on the x axis right there's x plus and x minus these two panels y axis y plus and y minus z plus and z minus right so if you know the frequency at which the the voltages are going up and down you can calculate the tumble rate of the satellite that's one way to do it okay the other is a more intuitive way which is the satellite will the satellite signal itself will keep fading on and off right so you know suddenly the beacon becomes very very you know dull and then it vanishes into the noise and then it again comes back so you know that the satellite has taken a tumble the antenna right went down and then you know came up again and then went down again etc so the more you listen to satellites the more data you will get and now apart from that uh, you will also get through telemetry stuff like you know how the internal battery is doing and that's actually a very important thing because the most important thing to manage in a satellite is its power budget how are you you know doing the power you know whether you need uh, to you know, switch the batteries off or switch them on again turn turn down something else you know if the batteries can't be overcharged they can't be undercharged i mean there there's a lot of stuff there especially with the new satellites where they use these lithium batteries so lithium batteries are actually far more fragile than uh, the old nickel cadmium or the nickel metal hydride batteries because if the if the temperature uh, of the battery dips beyond a certain point then you can't switch on the battery again right so what you do is as the battery's temperature is going down you use whatever you know uh, energy is there in the battery to switch on some heaters which will keep the battery switched on so uh, that is the i can't see myself hello can you guys see me yes sir you are visible and audible okay no because my video has been unpinned okay sorry <clears throat> so uh, uh you know with telemetry you can actually become experts at figuring out what's happening with this with these satellites number one number two is that uh, on the indian side there are very few stations which are actually uh, gathering telemetry for uh, 
other missions, right? So there are hundreds of missions now. And if you can on a voluntary basis, start recording the telemetry and sending it back to the mission owners, they'll be really happy. And that's actually a way of getting involved with a lot of other satellite missions. For example, at, uh, at Satellize, we contributed to the light sail. I don't know if you've heard of this mission. So the mission was very simple. There's a CubeSat in which they had done this incredible amount of engineering where they stuffed a very large sail, right? So the satellite was only about this big, but it unfurled a sail, which was huge. It was about, you know, probably the size of a tennis court. And they use a sail onto which the you know, sun's radiation hits it and that actually propels it forward and it sort of accelerates it. So they successfully proved that by that acceleration, they could raise the altitude of, uh, of, of light sail too. And it was giving out all this kind of telemetry, which uh, on, on this side of the world, I mean, you know, if it's, for example, if the mission control is in North America, they do not have uh, you know, any way of collecting data when the satellite is on this side of Earth. So uh, we started doing that for them and uh, for others. So uh, a lot of you know, stuff that we learned about building satellites actually came from uh, just monitoring the, 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 the satellites which are already up there in space. And uh, it also allowed us to uh, reach out to people who are building satellites because you see that space um, industry, although it's a cutting edge industry of, uh, you know, I mean, it's on the cutting edge of human exploration and, you know, what human beings can do. But the knowledge of building satellite and space missions is very tribal in nature. That is, it's done orally. There are very few books that you can read about, you know, how to build a satellite. There are some, but, you know, very few. On the other hand, there are probably, you know, in the world about 100, 200 people who have successfully built satellites upon satellites, you know, space missions after space missions, and they are very highly valued people. And when you start uh, being of help to them, you become friends with them, and, you know, there's a lot of information exchange, and, you know, uh, a lot of give and take happens. So uh, I would suggest that uh, you use this opportunity of having a ground station to start, you know, looking at how to build um, satellites and how they work, how to keep them up. Because you see, so what happens is for any space mission, it actually starts first with a ground station. So you build a ground station first, even before you build a satellite, because if you've built an engineering model of the satellite, you still need to test it out and you'll have to test it out against a ground station. So it's very important that first you have a ground station in place. So, you know, typically speaking, suppose you have a ground station in place, right? You say it's a VHF ground station. I can, you know, receive beacons. Next, what you do first is you take an Arduino and build a beacon transmitter with it. That is the kernel. That is the core of your future mission. And then you put this on, uh, onto your car or whatever, you know, Take it out, for example, if you're in Bombay, you take it out probably to Matharan and see if, you know, your ground station picks it up from there. Keep going further and further up the ghats or, um, you know, take it out into the sea or put it out into a balloon. So, um, but unless you have a ground station, which can receive the telemetry, process the telemetry, etc., you'll have no idea of, you know, how these things work. So, uh, to be able to experimentally design uh, space missions, the first thing that you do is actually put up the ground station. Now, apart from the low Earth uh, orbiting satellites, which are uh, interesting, of course, there are people who have done other stuff. For example, you know, the people who have uh, in the past, of course, uh, received telemetry from, uh, from Apollo 11. Uh, there is somebody I heard uh, who was able to also receive uh, Falcon 9 uh, flights and SpaceX flights, the, especially the human flights, right? They were able to actually capture that telemetry and data as well. And uh, very frequently, uh, many human uh, and manned uh, space missions ask volunteers to help out uh, in, you know, providing backup support. So that actually is uh, an equally interesting thing. There are a lot of weather satellites which will actually give you give out. Uh, 
uh, weather data. There are remote sensing satellites which are open uh, from the European Space Agency, which will give out spatial data that is, you know, uh, pictures of ground. You can, you know, probably directly take a picture of your home that is when it passes over it, of course. Uh, so <clears throat> these are actually some of the other stuff that you can do with uh, a ground station, especially if you have a tracking system and built into it. And given the fact that, you know, you're sitting in IIT, um, there is no reason why you should not build large parts of it. Okay. So um, uh, the radio is actually sorted out much easy. It's pretty easy to sort that out because now, given the fact that you have SDRs, uh, something like the Pluto from analog devices, it's a small box, you know, you just put that into a Raspberry Pi or onto a PC, and then you're, you know, you're done with the radio. Uh, power amplifiers are easy to buy, but antennas are actually one thing which I would, uh, you know, encourage you to build on your own because they will actually help you, you know, figure out uh, <clears throat> how these antennas work. They, they, they're not too difficult to build. They are pretty easy to build. And uh, tracking systems can be built by your instrumentation teams. They, it, it's a nice project for them to, you know, take care of and there are software available, including uh, somebody was asking on Android. Uh, there's actually a, uh, a software called GPredict. Uh, it's an open source software written entirely in C, uh, which actually um, is a port of a NASA's algorithm to uh, predict uh, the path of satellites. And as a result, it you know tells you that given this so-and-so satellite, when will you be able to see it over your own horizon and you know which way you have to point in terms of azimuth and elevation, et cetera. It's a fairly simple software with a GUI. There's a, there's a command line version of it available as well. So you can actually take these software, break them down and use them in whichever way you would like to. Uh, we actually built our own ground station when we started satellites. That was the first thing we did. It was built by, uh, you know, a great friend and a mentor for me, uh, George, we, George Thomas, uh, we 2 GT, uh, who was from Bombay. He unfortunately expired last year, big loss for us all. But uh, he was an antennas expert like no other. And uh, he built a fairly good, very robust antenna system, which we use even now. Uh, it's a UHF, VHF antenna system uh, with, uh, uh, it has, uh, you know, it has uh, stepper motors, fairly you know, powerful stepper motors, which will turn it in whichever direction and turn it quickly because some of the low earth orbit satellites move really fast, especially for example, ISS. Um, by the way, ISS is very interesting. Uh, one of the things to track, not only track, and this is the important thing, don't give up by just putting a receiver in. Have a full transceive capability where you can transmit as well. Because, for example, with ISS, very frequently the astronauts, uh, you know, get on air when they are done with the day's work. Uh, you can talk to them. Uh, they can actually give you pretty deep insights into, you know, life uh, in space and what kind of work they're doing. Uh, the ISS has a very powerful transmitter as well, so they're very easy to receive. Uh, in fact, you don't need uh, a directional antenna even with a walkie-talkie. You, know, you can just uh, go through them. Last two or three days, a lot of my friends have managed contacts through ISS. <clears throat> now they're actually uh, transmitting pictures, actually, still pictures uh, from the ISS. They have a whole schedule for the next two, three days for that to happen, but their schedule is available. Uh, and there are a number of sites which will tell you what are the current satellites which are, you know, uh, available. So uh, that actually is the important thing to do. Uh, the other thing that you can use your ground station for is to do ballooning. And this actually is a very important thing. And uh, you, you see what's happening now is that uh, given that ISRO has, is almost two and a half years late from their launches. I mean, for the last two years, there have been no low, low Earth orbit uh, satellites launched at all. So um, it will be difficult for Indian satellite builders to find free launches, right? Probably that, game, you know, that party is over now. 
Uh, instead, you can try for uh, putting very small payloads on balloons and flying these balloons. I mean, some of these balloons have circumnavigated the Earth. Uh, it's a pretty simple and straightforward thing to do. Uh, you can do it easily and repeatedly, uh, doing probably you know one launch a month to see you know how far it goes, you know what, how does it behave, especially in the upper atmosphere, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you see the 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 engineering principles remain just the same. You know you have to bother about power. You have to bother about uh, you know, what you would like to spend the power on, you know, keep the batteries charged, uh, get, you know, handle the solar panels. And for this stuff, you don't require very elaborate solar panels, which cost thousands of dollars. You can probably buy something from Lamington Road or something like that, you know, really low cost uh, uh, solar panels coupled with, you know, whatever, some battery or the other, and just fly these things. So, you get a good idea of uh, you know how to build these things to resiliently remain there you know what what are the parameters that you put into the telemetry what kind of a beacon uh, will last longest time i mean these are all small stuff where if you have a ground station you can very quickly build, build these you know small missions and then from there on you can you know once you have that experience then you can keep building on top of that so uh, <clears throat> That, uh, I mean, uh, those are the other advantages of doing the ground station. Apart from the ground stations for uh, the low Earth orbit satellites. Now there is a, there's a, there's a ham radio station, uh, you know, on board a geostationary satellite called Q100. Uh, that's actually also very easy to uh, receive. And the way you receive it is you basically take a Tata sky dish. And the Tata Sky is, uh, I mean, the thing with its uh, LNB, the low noise converter, and you basically connect that off to RTL SDR. It takes about you know an hour or two for you to set it up. I mean, instead of pointing towards Insat, you have to point it towards the SAL satellite, and you know just get onto the frequency. And the advantage of this is this, and this is the you know big thing that for example, you have some, let's say guest coming in to see your club station. And then you say, no, there's no, hardly any satellite. You know, we'll have to get onto the roof, uh, you know, pull out the Yagi antenna, et cetera, et cetera. This is on 24 by seven because the geostation satellite is not going anywhere. So uh, you can always switch on and listen to people talking through the satellite. There are two, um, beacons also available the beacons really don't do much i mean they don't have much telemetry but the beacons are there in any case but that's actually a good thing to put through uh, on your uh, ground station because it's something that you can always switch on and tune in and figure out you know what people are talking about etc there are a lot of people who work low earth orbit satellites who are also available there and you can actually go through and start talking to those people our Lamakan MH Radio Club has put a, an up converter in place, very cheap uh, to build, also available as a kit. You can talk to the Lamakan MH Radio Club to get a unit, <clears throat> which can help you do the uplink at 2.4 gigahertz. It takes about three watts to get through the satellite. So um, that's actually another recommendation that I would make for you to do that. But the, you know, ultimately, uh, what I would like you to do is this: that once the ground station is in place, it's like having an observatory for astronomers, right? Our various kinds of projects that you can uh, look at. Uh, for example, how do satellites age, right? Um, in terms of you know what happens to their batteries, what happens to their solar panel, etc. So if you, for example, take any particular CubeSat mission and keep tracking these parameters through the telemetry over weeks and months and plot it down, then you have a good idea of you know, how they are aging, whether you know, it's going to go down, not go down, what altitude it is at. <clears throat> there are various ways of actually figuring out the altitude, especially for the linear satellites. By linear satellites, I mean, if you transmit a signal, the signal comes back, right? And if you know how much time it's taking for it to make the round trip, you know how far away the satellite is. So with that, uh, in place, uh, you can actually uh, figure out whether the two line elements of the satellite are correct or not. 
that can itself be a project. So you can actually think of a lot of projects which are interesting, which can be done quickly, or some of them long-term projects, etc., which you can, uh, you know, uh, produce for um, for people who are interested in this sort of work, uh, publish papers. Uh, the important thing really here is, as I said earlier, to write down all your observations, to document everything that you do very carefully and meticulously. Um, so, um, you know, I remember this, that I'd gone to the SAMSAT convention and I told of a, a, a veteran, uh, you know, I think his name is Alan King, that I had contacted him um, in 84 uh, through Oscar 7. And uh, he said, oh, really, let me just look up. He actually pulled out his logbook and said, uh, yeah, uh, that's right. You know, you were view to FAX at that time and on so and so date. I have it written down in my logbook here. I was using a double Yagi from uh, England. And uh, that day the weather was so and so. He had even written down, you know, how good the weather was. So I was really impressed that, you know, uh, he was able to pull out something which was almost 30, 35 years old and, uh, you know, quickly go back to that. So that's a sort of meticulous detail that almost anybody who works in science has to do. So that's one of the things, you know, don't bother too much about, you know, budgets, etc. Um, make it as simple as you can. You already have, I think, uh, you know, a, a fairly decent amount of equipment, but the idea is to use it and use it all the time and you know, make it into some sort of an obsession, right? I mean, look, people play PUBG or you know, do, do TikTok, et cetera. Your, your thing should be, you know, okay, let me get on, uh, switch it on now and see whether there are any birds that I can snag. And that itself should become uh, you know, a game that you play among yourselves. And you, know, you say, okay, you know, this guy has got 15 birds under him. You know, she has got you know, 12 birds, et cetera. So that's actually the thing to do. So that's it. If there are any questions, I'll take them. Uh, but otherwise, thank you so much for inviting me to give this keynote. I tried keeping it informal because you'll see a lot of formal presentations uh, through the day. And I hope that, you know, you have a great time and above it all, you know, enjoy. And uh, this is a hobby. This is not, I mean, this is not going to be on exam or you're not going to get a rank out of this. But nevertheless, that means that, you know, uh, you're going to enjoy this. It's, it's a very enjoyable hobby. Thank you. Uh, Farhan, sir. Uh, just a second. Uh, we uh, Everyone can raise their hands if you <clears> want <throat> to ask a question. Uh, firstly, I would like to really thank, sir, for this uh, keynote speech. Uh, it was really insightful and very like very hands-on. So uh, we could actually gain a lot of uh, ideas and things to actually carry out, even for IIT, BSSP and all the participants who are here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, people can raise their hands. We'll take a question, uh, questions one by one. Uh, yeah, Shruti, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, good morning, sir. Hi. Uh, so, uh, receiving the telemetry from Apollo 11, uh, like that we can receive uh, telemetries from other satellites and uh, other uh, space stations like that. Uh, can you please elaborate on that? Well, you know, it's a, it's a refined art. Good that you asked me the question because Apollo 11's telemetry was not um uh, public i mean the format was not public they figured out what frequencies they were transmitting at of course and then they captured it and this these days i mean at that time nobody even had uh, had computers so what they did is that they recorded this entire thing on spools recorder they, there were no cassette recorders either in those days and uh, <clears throat> You know, from whatever other snippets they had, for example, I mean, Apollo 11 was such a launch program that it was well documented and, you know, a lot of subcontractors were given out uh, details of, uh, you know, the sort of modulators that they had purchased, et cetera, et cetera. So they figured out what kind of modulation it was. And, you know, after analyzing multiple number of frames, then they figured out that there were, you know, 63 or 64 uh, parameters which were there. And then they figured out what those parameters stood for because, for example, if there's a, uh, they had a ranging transponder. So the ranging transponder essentially took a signal and returned it back. So you knew how far out the, uh, the, the Apollo 11 module was from earth. And uh, they figured that, you know, that was one parameter which kept increasing along with distance. So it was a lot of 
very fun, um, you know, reverse engineering. But, you know, closer home uh, are other stuff that a lot of radio hams have done. So uh, if you, I don't know whether you guys remember this, but when Chandrayaan failed to uh, properly, you know, land on moon, the prime minister was there and, you know, everybody was there and it was being live telecast on, on, on television. So, uh, you know, then it failed and everybody said, all right, you know, we'll uh, end the transmission now. The, you know, it was a very emotional scene. If you remember, you know, the prime minister hugged the ISRO's chairman, et cetera, all that was happening. But there was one guy who was following it from the US. And what he did was that whenever the camera showed the situation, uh, you know, those big displays, he basically took screenshots of that. Okay. He took screenshots of that and poured over it for days and figured out what exactly had gone wrong, even before ISRO had sat down to do their analysis. It was really a brilliant piece of engineering. It's available on the, uh, on the internet somewhere as a YouTube video where he shows you know, what he's done. So uh, <clears throat> these are you know, the things that people manage to pull off. Uh, they are hacks. You know, they are the real hackers who are able to reverse engineer this stuff. And figure out, you know, how exactly these things happen. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, Arpit, you can ask a question. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, sir. Morning. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you, like, uh, what was your inspiration or the aim of the of making the Vitex trans uh, transceiver kits and mm. What approach did you take? Can you like elaborate a little bit on the uh, this? Yeah, uh, uh, well, it's it's a long story, and you know, I want to condense it off into half a minute or a minute. But uh, basically, what happened was, as a as a kid, uh, I didn't have the money to buy a radio set. They were very expensive. You know, I mean, in eighties, those sets cost about twenty thousand rupees, which is probably about twenty lakh rupees today. So, uh, and there were a couple of radio hams who had built their own radio sets. In fact, quite a few of them. But the problem was that all of them used uh, parts which were not easily available. They were, you know, I mean, you know, you had to go and beg and borrow from someone, you know, get some exotic part or not, et cetera, et cetera. So it was very difficult for anyone to help anybody else because, you, you know, someone would say, no, actually, you know, I just built the transmitter because for receiver, I got this receiver, which is a second world war thing. I sort of repaired it and got it going, et cetera. So uh, what changed really for me was uh, that I started reading these books written by a couple of radio hands like Doc Demo and Wes Hayward, uh, <clears throat> which really broke down the art of radio designing into just four really simple circuits, right? Mixers, filters, amplifiers, and oscillators. The, the, just these four things, right? You have mixer <clears throat> and mixers are, you know, you can make a mixer with just four diodes, right? I mean, each diode costs about 50 paise. Um, you can make an amplifier, I realized, uh, using transistors, which are available in India. It's just that nobody used them. Everybody, you know, because we read books which are coming from the US, we were you know, trying to get transistors which the US hams had used here, which were of course not available. So uh, <clears throat> I just went back to the fundamentals and started to build these functional blocks, an amplifier, an oscillator, mixer, filters. Uh, <clears throat> and in, in order to build these and know whether they are working or not, I mean, you know, see what happens is usually you build a complete circuit diagram, switch it on and say, oh, my, it's not working because Typically, it would have about 300 components, right? And if one component was not placed properly, the entire thing wouldn't work. So there was very, very little chance that it would actually work if you just build the entire circuit diagram. So what I started doing was I started building very small uh, circuit diagrams with just you know one transistor and a couple of resistors and capacitors around it. See whether that works. And for that, I built a signal generator and a power uh, detector so that you know I could know whether the signal was passing through properly or not. And a frequency counter to you know, count the frequency of the signals which is coming through. So <clears throat> with that, 
in a couple of months time i got a good hang of these blocks and what was again of each block you know what is the frequency of each block etc then mm -hmm. it was a simple matter of you know just integrating them you know two blocks at a time does this work okay now the, put the third block on the fourth fifth sixth etc and finally we got the bitx going so uh, the, the bitx actually is um, can be built for about 500 rupees and it actually became a big hit all over the world because the way i had built it was that you know you could always substitute parts for others and you know scale it up and down the frequency etc so uh, and i think far more important than you know any remarkable work that i had done was the fact that i had given it out in open source and that that's one of the big things that you should learn to do which is uh, start working with open source because that's your quickest way to success uh, being open source people can come down and point out and say this was not done right that was done right you know let's fix this you know get that going you know if it's software of course there are bugs but even in hardware there are bugs so uh, that's actually um, in a nutshell the story of bitx yeah uh, thank you sir for that answer uh, i had one, uh, one last question for my side uh, do you have any advice for anyone uh, who who would like to like undertake <clears throat> similar kind of home brewing project well i mean you know uh, what's the advice the advice is to you know just get <laughs> off your ass and start making it uh, the important thing that i would say is this uh, build your test instruments first okay usually you know we are in such a big hurry to build the radios that you know all you think you need is a soldering iron that's not true actually so uh, you need a pair of signal generators not one but a pair of signal generators uh, you need um, a power detector of some sort and a frequency counter with and a step attenuator right a step attenuator is a thing which can you know uh, basically the number of switches on it and you can switch on any amount of attenuation in 1 db steps up to about you know, 70 80 db it's very easy to make basically a lot of switches and a lot of resistors but what happens with the step attenuator is that you are able to control the signal level going in or coming out and you can accurately measure it by you know uh um, being able to scale it down and or scale it up etc so with those five or six things that you build first and you know a decently low noise power supply which is basically a linear power supply don't go in for an smps with that in place you can actually start building your own uh, radio work it's actually pretty much amazing because you know given that there are four fundamental um, forces of nature you know electricity magnetism gravity and weak forces a radio hobby or ham radio hobby is the one where people are able to control at least two out of those four which is electro you know electrical and magnetic energies and forces and you know uh, use them to communicate with each other which is really an amazing thing because you can't control gravity and you know if you want to break an atom and play around with weak forces you need to own a large hadron collider but uh electromagnetic waves are so easy to do i mean you know you can buy a whole bag of components which will last you for years for probably about 1000 rupees you know including all the uh, cutter soldering iron solder you know screw drivers etc and sit at home or wherever in your own spare time uh keep you know building electronics so electronics that was a wonderful hobby you know it's an ability to do science personally without you know having to work for tifr or one of these big places thank you sir thank you sir uh, next we have a question from virin uh, virin you can unmute yourself yeah hello um, hi virin yeah uh, hello it was uh, great hearing from you again actually i had uh, i had met you in sppo's workshop for satellite designing oh uh, okay yeah uh, but at that time uh, we on this point of uh, i mean we did but i did not have this question that it would, would it be possible to just develop a certain kind of a battery which would be specifically for low temperatures <clears throat> i mean as and when we are approaching yeah. to new space exploration uh, mm -hmm. uh, advances and we would need to develop this type of a battery right and is such type of battery being developed or is this a problem statement that uh, still been working on and well it uh, you know frankly speaking it is a problem statement okay and the fact is this that unlike electronics uh, battery development is actually um, 
a very gradual process. In fact, you know, we haven't really made any breakthroughs in the battery te technology for decades now. Uh, so uh, the best we have is a lithium ion battery. I mean, there are now metal batteries and solid state batteries which have just come out and there are these super capacitors which have come out, but uh, really the, the weight to energy ratio of the lithium polymer battery is unmatched as of now. So whether it's a, a Tesla car or you know they are geostationary satellites or whatever it is, uh, we are still dependent on just that to you know, power us. Then even batteries are essentially energy storage, right? I mean, uh, secondary storage that is. The, and the, it's the solar panels which generate power and you basically use, uh, it's stored in batteries until you actually get to use it. Uh, one, other, one way out of this actually is very interesting, which is have no battery at all. <clears throat> so the Oscar 7 had uh, nickel uh, cadmium batteries. Uh, it was launched in 1970 late 1970s okay about 40 years ago and it went kaput of course after some time but of late it woke up again because what happened is that the batteries which are shorting became an open we don't know why so it works when it's in sunlight and uh, <clears throat> it's probably one of the few satellites which are more almost you know 40 years old and it's working now and it'll continue working that's the amazing part it'll continue working for a long time because there are no batteries for it for, a, for it to you know for the blow up so <clears throat> uh, now they are planning missions which will not depend on the life of the battery itself okay which will work in sunlight and actually if you look at a low earth orbit satellite okay the entire orbit is about 90 minutes and out of the 90 minutes for probably about less than half an hour it's an eclipse right so uh, one way to also think of it is that you instead of a battery, you can probably you know make do with a supercapacitor or some other thing, you know, or a flywheel, for example, inside it. I mean, flywheel will be difficult because it will upset the attitude, but there can be other ways of actually storing um, energy for that shorter time instead of using a battery. Okay, okay. So I was more concerned about the deep space exploration uh, satellites, which would be. Yeah, um, I mean, like Voyager see, and yeah, uh, I get it. But I mean, for deep space explorations, batteries won't do it at all because, you know, how are yeah. you going to generate the power to Again, those yeah. batteries, right? So uh, if you look at the Voyager, the Voyager actually uses um, uses nuclear power. It does not use batteries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. So the last yeah. question we'll take from Samrat. Uh, Samrat, you can unmute yourself. Hello, sir. Good right. morning. Yeah, yeah. Sir, uh, you talk about this uh, linear satellites, right? So one again, that same question which popped in my mind about this linear. So you get any, like you talked about telemetry. So you get the timings in that, like how long and like uh, you transmit and then you get back your signal. So you get the timings in that? Well, uh, you do not get timing in that. Um, I mean, th there's no time stamping which is happening there, but you, if you've transmitted a signal, you know at what time you transmitted it and what time you received it back. So it's as simple as that. So uh, you can time yourself, right? For example, I mean, on your oscilloscope, if you have uh, two channels, one channel, you know, shows you the pulse as it's going up, another channel actually, you know, displays the pulse as it's coming back, then you know what okay. the time difference between the two is. Yeah? Okay. And no, the, sir, I mean, like, these satellites are basically called bend pipes. That is, whatever signal goes up, it just comes down at a different frequency. That's all. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, another thing, sir, like, uh, is it possible we can get in touch? Like, can can you please share your uh, email or your contact details? Yeah, um, I'm I'm putting it in my in the chat. Uh, yeah, we because we found your talk very really interesting, so it will be great if we can you know get in touch. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I've, I've put my email there in the chat. Okay, guys. So if you're if you're done, you know, it was great, you know, meeting you guys. You were fairly enthusiastic about it, and I I, I really wish you all you know best of luck, and I hope to see you uh, on some satellite, huh. you know. Quite Sir, uh, I would uh, request you to wait for another five minutes. We have an announcement okay. which you would like to. Okay. 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 Yeah. okay. All right.
Yeah. So thanks a lot, sir, for such an insightful yeah. talk and also taking time to answer all the questions. Uh, so yeah, <clears throat> we have an announcement to make now. So we are all set to launch the HRC uh, website and what can be a better occasion to do it than our flagship event. So presenting to you the HR uh, Ham Radio Club website. I hope my screen is visible. Uh, yeah, it's visible. Yes. Yeah. So here you can catch glimpses of uh, some of our past events, all the activities uh, and sessions that we do in Ham Radio Club. Uh, like this is the ground station of Pratham and our team from ground, uh, ground station works of 2020, which used to be conducted in offline mode in the previous years. And the sessions that we do, start like tracking antenna, making a radio shack. And you can also read more about what ham radio as a hobby in general is and what uh, we as a team at ham radio club strive to do and uh, all and information on the equipment which we have in our radio shack. And you can find more about all the activities and events that we have in, uh, have it, uh, that we do at HRC, our flagship event ground station workshop, hands-on sessions, antenna making and satellite tracking. And you can also find relevant links and resources uh, to if you wish to explore more on anything so that uh, you don't get stuck and you can find out more. And the various technical activities, satellite tracking, radio astronomy, CCTV module. And we also have the detailed uh, uh, procedure for the ham radio exam, the syllabus and the procedure for application and uh, relevant resources so that you can get uh, started with your preparation for ham exam. And the blog, this blog, the blog section on the website can take you to the HRC blog page, Stories of a Naive Radio, where we host a lot of information on ham radio and various topics related to ham radio. So yeah, we also have the contact, contact us feature from where you can ask anything uh, about anything you wish to do uh, uh, us. And so, yeah, this uh, was- Can you yeah. show the SSTV module page? Sure. So, sir, we are actually trying to build uh, an SSTV module which you want to test on a high altitude balloon. Uh, we are okay. uh, uh, doing it from scratch. So, just like you mentioned in your mm -hmm. pre uh, presentation, yeah. this is something we are yeah. trying to do. Mm -hmm. Very good, excellent. So, uh, hope, yeah. what what uh, CPU etc. will it be based on? Do you have have you? You know, finalized it on will that. be a microcontroller uh, like based okay. uh, tra yeah. a transmitter which we mm -hmm. want to test on a high altitude balloon. Okay, oh, yeah. Yeah. very good. It's, it's, it, it'll, be, it'll be a great idea. It's a yeah, great we're idea. currently in the design stage, and we like aim to actually uh, equip school students with low cost receivers to actually receive this. So we also mm -hmm. have yeah. that on plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I would request everyone to visit our website, know about us, and. Uh, contact us in in case of any queries doubts or uh, if you want to get in touch with us so yeah fantastic finally Great. also like to thank sir once again for uh, his presence and all the guidance that he shared today thank you so much thank you sir yeah so after the launch of